Thank you, Elder Edward. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I trust the Lord. We sang the song just now. I seeked him, or I sought him, and he heard. God hears. Not just he hears because we speak and his ears are good. He hears especially when we are seeking him for something very, very specific. My quick testimony is as a young man after graduation, of course, I was very fortunate. I got to work as a graduate engineer and so on. But there were habits that I had, in particular with alcohol, there were habits I had that was foolish. So I crashed my car more than once. And I came to a conclusion that if I live like that, I'm going to die young. So there was enough common sense to realize that that is not a good thing. So one night in the pub full of smoke and whiskeys and beers and everything else, I had a conversation. At that time, I thought it was a conversation with myself. But I said something like this. I said, God, I, I should change, otherwise I die young but I don't know how to. Then the thought came that I was still single. I thought maybe I can change when I get married because that would be a completely different chapter, right? That was a few decades ago. Today, I'm happily married, my wife, Christina. I have three adult sons and four granddaughters. I'm alive and many, many details in between. My late father did not look after himself very well, and that's my honest opinion. I can say that because I'm his son, and he's already in heaven, so that's all right, I guess. He died aged 60 years old. So while growing up and progressing as an adult, you can't help but thinking that passed on at 60. I better go past that. I must resist any thought that I will follow his footsteps. I'm past 60. I'm still alive. Amen. The details can vary. The details, this and that, for everybody's life is different. But the encouragement is this. Seek him. I can tell you, he can be trusted. Our lives... You know, we go through many chapters and phrases and so on and so forth. But the constant factor is this. Every time we seek Him, He can be trusted and He's faithful. Amen. The only thing is we have to understand Him, His ways. And after a while, you get the hang of it. You get the hang of it. He's merciful. His blood cleanses us. He's full of grace. We don't deserve, but He's there, right? And merciful, faithful, He is holy, mind you, and just. So we don't cross lines. And if we do, and the con our conscience tells us that, hey, that was not right or not good, then quickly, quickly, sorry, Lord, help me, strengthen me in this area. Stay on the right side. Every believer has been imputed righteousness. It's a gift. Righteous means we stand before God as if we have never sinned. We are right. We have a right standing with Him. That's why the topic just now for Rima in the coming July module is so important. With abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You enjoy His grace and His gift of righteousness. You reign in life. How's that? For reigning in life. Huh? Not the weather or the farm or the employer or bad guys or the bully or whatever it is. You reign. And God has positioned you there to reign. Amen. 
He created Adam and Eve in the garden. It was all very good. What did he say? Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion. That means reign. Reign. Over all the creation with all its potential, with seeds and so on of its kind. Reign. Multiply. Make it even better, even greater. Let God's glory shine even brighter. Reign. Take dominion. Hallelujah. That's our God. I have a, like a, what do you call it? Um, a quote, like a slide. Are you ready to show the slide? This just to spice our message a bit. From Kenneth Hagin. This is not from the Bible. It's from Kenneth Hagin, but it's condensed. Can you read it together? Faith changes hope into reality. Right. It's good to have hope, especially hope in good things and right things. But hope on its own doesn't get you anywhere. You are hoping sometime in the future, maybe it will come. On the other hand, maybe it will not. But we just hope. La. God is not like that. Faith is now. God is outside time. When I believe, that hope becomes a reality. Otherwise, your hope is in the wind. With faith in God is anchored in Him and His very nature. He does not change and is trustworthy. Amen. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Right? You can hope, but if you don't have faith, you're in the wind, man. You're on your own. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's already there. You have not yet seen it, but it will surely come. Amen. Faith changes hope into reality. I want to go back to our action plan. Besides those points, which includes praying for five names to be saved, the top few lines says this, from Lot 244, which is this address now, at the time I wrote this was February in 24, to Lot 6591 in 2026. Whatever is listed below this must carry our faith that brings the hope into a reality. Amen. This gives the, the frame. I'm happy to report that the tender evaluation process and the clarification process is complete. I have read the draft report from the quantity surveyor and uh, very little to comment on. So I believe by next week it should all consolidate and I will have to be in communication with our secretary who is the field secretary of BM in Miri, our headquarters, to discuss with him. And prayerfully, he will, be a, he will be agreeable to all the details. And then we can issue a letter of award so that construction can commence as soon as possible. Of course, there are other administrative details to look into and construction details. So that's a lot of work still ahead. But at least it's moving there. While that is happening, brothers and sisters in Christ, all of us here must also be equally conscious that God is building us. We are building that physical building, but from the foundations of the world, God has his plan. And so we must allow God's plan to move through us with understanding so that what he's trying to build with us and through us happens. We participate with him and allow him to use us as his building blocks that he realizes and his plan comes to fruition. Amen. Often we say, we invite, Lord, come, more of your presence. 
we must also understand God inviting us boldly to his throne of grace. We say, come Lord. He's saying, come, I'm here. So we ask him to come. We must also be willing to go to him. Amen. And allow it to happen when we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That includes him building us a holy temple in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 21. And a spiritual house in 1 Peter 2 verses 4 to 5. So let's read the Ephesians chapter 2 part. Verse 19 to 22. There's a context for our message today. Ephesians 2 verses 19 to 22. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners talking to the believers in the city of Ephesus, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So you cannot be ignorant. You're not strangers or foreigners that you don't understand the culture or the purpose and so on but your fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom, BM Grace, you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. But this is towards the end of chapter 2 in Ephesus, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. Very quickly, you read about Paul's founding the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. By the time he wrote this, it's been a few decades already, and he wrote this letter while he was in prison in Rome. So in other words, this was a letter that he wrote to Ephesus on the first day. Ephesus was a, a city, a port city by the sea. Very prosperous, very significant, part of the trade routes. And it housed a lot of temples. All the Greek gods are there and all the Roman gods are there. It's busy, it's influential, it's very independent and so on. And Paul found himself there and he evangelized, he set up his church and it drew a good following. So he was a very well established church. Many years later, he wrote this. The importance to us is this. When we started a little bit over 20 years ago in this place, many of us were already believers. But the Holy Spirit saw it fit to refresh us about the, God, the grace of God, about His righteousness, about the New Testament realities, about what, it's mean, what it's, it means to be in Christ. And later on we realized a lot of this is actually in the Rima school. And so it's no surprise that the Rima school came here and got started here 12 years ago. So it was a refreshing. Many of us have been Christians for many years, more than 10 years, right? But we still needed a refreshing. And I dare say today, 2024, BM Grace, even though we had that start and plenty of teaching and training in between, not all of us comprehend what God's plan is for his people. We have ideas sort of and the fact that Paul had to write this letter to the Ephesians to give them a spiritual dimension to give them blueprints of what God has done what God continues to do what may be expected of the people of that he calls the church so he's not just gathering in the temple that instead of worshiping Jupiter or worshiping the Roman Emperor we now worship this God that cannot be seen. Somehow he died on the cross and he resurrected. His name is Jesus. And then our sins are forgiven and so on and so forth. Just vague things. 
as an alternative to the Greek gods. What can be confusing is inside the church, there are also Jews. And so they bring with them their experience of animal sacrifices and so on. They no longer carry on those sacrifices, but they bring their history with them. And so the Gentiles can be a bit confused. Am I correct? And they didn't have any Bibles. <laughs> and the only Bibles was the Old Testament and was written in Hebrew. So if you are Greek or Roman, you also catch no ball. Amen. So God saw it fit to write. We heard last week the Apostle Paul in chapter 1 telling us or telling them, and we should be reminded also, God's grand plan from day one, that his people are presented to him holy, blameless, in love. And that was not possible because of sin. And so he sent Jesus to fix the problem so that that intent remains. And how does he fix the problem? Well, he goes to the cross. There's redemption in his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Wow. That means we were, what? Taken away. A ransom had to be paid. We were kidnapped by the enemy. Snatched from God's presence with a lie. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve believed. And so Jesus came to pay the price, the ransom. And God being just and holy, the price of sin is death. So Jesus paid that price. There's redemption in his blood. Making us accepted in the beloved through the forgiveness of sins. Amen. And the list goes on. And he says that, well, you guys believed. After us, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul says, after we had believed, we came and shared with you that you believe. And because you believe, you're benefiting the same thing. But let me tell you what it is that you are really benefiting from. It's not just an alternate God. The Greeks have plenty of gods. The Romans added theirs. Then the Romans says, I think our emperors should be gods also. So they added the emperors to just add a few more. This is not an alternative. It is different. And because you believe just like we believe, you have put your trust in him for eternal life. And since I've heard of that, I have not ceased to pray for you that you get revelation of much more. Am I correct? Revelation of much more. That your spiritual wisdom, your eyes of understanding opens to spiritual wisdom into the much more that God has given us. Much more that He has done. Wherever you are, wherever you are, you need to know the hope of His calling. So BM Grace, He has called us and there's a hope. So there's an individual calling and hope and purpose and function. But collectively, He has also called us and given us a purpose. And hence, we are handling Lot 6591. Amen. I hope you see that it's not just me and a few fellows trying to put this building up. <laughs> I need all of you to be in. If you're not in the brick and mortar of things, then you're in the church building of things. Amen? In the spiritual sense. But everybody needs to participate. There are riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So it's, there's glory and there's riches. So come on, that should be interesting enough, right? It's not misery and poverty and sadness. It's riches and glory of God in his company. And then we talked about the greatness of his power towards us and his mighty power that sits Jesus in the highest place. We are there in him. We're not yet there with him. We will be there with him when he comes. But presently, we are there in him. Amen. Then the Apostle Paul moves to chapter 2. The first word in chapter 2 is the word and. So that's a conjunction, right? I'm an engineer, I do a bit of maths. Although I speak English, I'm not very good at grammar. 
But I do know that N is a con sambong. N connects what was there to what's that side, all right? And you, in your English Bible, the next few letters are in italics. That means it was inserted by the translators to help the context become clear. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now listen, did you realize that we were dead in trespasses and sins? I came to the conclusion that if I don't change my ways, I might just die young because I was stupid enough to crash my car. In fact, I crashed to other people too. Fortunately, no one died, but that's another story. Paul says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Wow, not a nice thing to talk to people about, right? You, you know? <laughs> and he's addressing the church. He's not fearful that he might offend somebody by this kind of language. Dead in trespasses, it means you cross God's red line. Trespassing. Trespassing into his holiness. You dare to attempt to go to God and worship him as if he's just like all the other gods to the Greeks and the Romans. You cross the line. You think you're worshiping God. You call his name, but you have no idea that you got it all wrong. You are trespassing. And in sin, you miss God's best mark for you. You got it all wrong. Wow, that's where we were before. He says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom all, we also, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. In the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Wow. Were we really that bad? This is spiritual truth that brings us, should bring us to an awareness. You are saved today because you believe. This is to tell you the reality of where we were. We had no concept, right? If we know the details of our family and our family trees, Rapandai, Sometimes years later, you got gray hairs like me, we're still trying to work out our family tree. You know? But here, Paul is telling, look, this, this is the spiritual reality of where we were and what God has done. And when you believe, that's how you get translated out of that place, out of the domain of the devil, out of the domain of just fulfilling our lust. Me, my eye. I want to do this, I want to do this, this is what I want to do, who cares? Everybody does it anyhow, so who cares? So you become little gods. Verse 4, another wonderful word, but. Remember we started with N, and now it's but. In contrast, in contrast. But God, who is what? Rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you were saved. The previous description of death is now contrasted with life. God life, the thing that really matters since we were created by him. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In other words, the riches of his grace towards us will not stop when Jesus comes again is going to continue for all eternity. How about that? 
You know, it's not like uh, subsidy, uh, but now we rationalize, uh, maybe tomorrow no more. Jaga you. You better prepare. No, there's no rationalization, there's no subsidy here. It is full on His grace and His mercy. Because He has so much more to show us and bless us. Things we cannot even comprehend or mention or describe because we have never seen. And all of that is going to come as a matter of the exceeding riches of His grace. Verse 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This entire mercy, blessing, life, grace for eternity, and the provision, and God Himself, it's all a gift. Nothing to do with you, me, or anybody. It is God's good pleasure. Amen. I think we begin to get a glimpse of the goodness of God here and try and help share this with your friends who may have questions about God and, and then when you think about life and all the difficulties and so on and so forth, like, do you really believe in God? <laughs> if He's around, why are these other things around? And why, why am I in this situation? Or something like that. Help them see if they are not yet safe, they are dead. It's puzzling. Questions have been asked. How can you save somebody who is dead? Do you have to be partially alive before you become fully a believer? Like, hang on, that's very complicated, right? Well, maybe the best way is this. We are, we are a three-part person, right? Body, spirit, and soul. The spirit part is dead because there's no God life. It just has natural life. Some people's natural life are very, very short. Stillbirth. That's very short. Other people live up to the 90s and 100s. Very long. So there's a, a range there. But we have a physical body. So long as we are alive in this physical body, we can understand. We have the five senses are in operation. We sense pain. We sense joy. And God uses all of that to communicate. And then He will communicate either through the gospel when people are around that can share. And when there's nobody to share, He will still communicate because nature will then broadcast His presence and His existence. He will somehow make it known that people can make their choice. So at the end of the day, there is no excuse. No excuse whatsoever. But to us who understand, it is a gift. Verse 10, For we are His workmanship. He has made us for something special. We are his workmanship. A musician who writes his best piece. Wow. He wrote it or she wrote it for some, some purpose. Something drove him. It was beautiful. It was purposeful. It was done. Or an art or a sculpture or something. Or an architect with a building. Whatever it is. Or you as a teacher. You have poured your life. And you, you are just excited to see those young lives transform. Because of your input. We are His workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works. Sometimes it's difficult to understand your good works. What does that mean? I just give some manila to the beggar downstairs. Is it good works? What else can I do? I help my grandma cross the road or whatever. Maybe we try and go back to the Garden of Eden and connect with the word fruitfulness. This is just me sketching it in pencil and see how it works. For fruitfulness. In verse 27 of Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And everybody who is in a transgender and they want to confuse this truth will have a problem with fruitfulness. They'll just bring division and pain not fruitfulness. 
because it runs contrary to God's word. And verse 28, when he has done that, created everything and man and woman in his own image, God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Don't just think of biological procreation, although that is there also, but the up, all the potential that is there, every seed, of the fruit of the tree and so on and so forth has the potential to, to multiply. All the animals have potential. And there's just potential. Adam and Eve messed it all up. We never saw what it could do. But we can see what it can do. You can cross-pollinate flowers and make something even more amazing. Remember there were some Romantic stories about the black rose and Zorro and stuff like that. You know, but it's just a movie, okay? Anyhow, potentials that we never really understood was implied there. Verse 29, God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. We never saw the potential. Because they messed up. God is putting all of that back that we as new creations with the image of Christ in front of us are being transformed into that image day by day, faith to faith. As we infuse ourselves with the understanding of his word, we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and reveal to us. When our heart says, Lord, I want to be a part of what you are doing. I don't claim to fully understand it, but I can get the gist of it that there is a physical building like what Cyrus the king says to Ezra and company. The Lord who has given me everything says, hey, you Jews, go back to Jerusalem, build him a house. Take what you need. I have instructions from him, and so I instruct you. So we know there is a physical house, a physical building. But in the New Testament, God is also building a spiritual house, a holy habitation for himself. So, it's not so much Holy Spirit indwells us who are believers. That is true. But the Holy Spirit indwells this temple of God, his holy place, among all of us, not just individually. Amen. And so, the, we need to relate to one another and be very conscious of this that we too individually are part of the building blocks. Not just a contractor we're selecting to build what's the physical structure in Lot 6591. And so we, should, we need to be conscious, conscious of this and, and allow God to, to move us that we open our hearts and say, yes, Lord. After all, did we not say often, not my will, but your will be done? Echoing the words of Jesus. That is about your kingdom coming, not about my kingdom becoming. It's your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. Praise the Lord. Then in verse 11 of chapter 2, another conjunction word. This time, therefore. Because of all the things that have been said, now, this is the outcome. Therefore, remember that you once Gentile in the flesh, remember you, once non-Christians, after pursuits of your, yourself, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. In other words, you Gentiles, the Jews will address you as uncircumcised. And the Jews will call themselves circumcised. But it's all done by hands. Because later on in, in Colossians, it says that Christ has circumcised us by the Spirit. So it's not physical circumcision that is 
the important point that has a historical significance. But in Christ, he has circumcised our heart and marked us all for him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ. Dead in trespasses and sins, right? At that time, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Remember, you were once there. Then he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Amen. So where are we now? Far from God or very near to God? We're in Christ and He is in us. He is with us and so on and so forth. You, you cannot separate us. You cannot separate God from you, even though sometimes we might do dumb things and say dumb things and, and so on and so forth. That's a time to pinch and kick yourself and correct yourself. That God is for you, not against you. You were once dead in sins and trespasses without a, any knowledge or hope in God, but now you are near by the blood of Christ. And he is near you. Not Old Testament to make sure that everybody is ritually clean and the animal sacrifice must be perfect. The priest must hold himself well, otherwise he gets struck dead. It's not that. But the space between us and him has been made perfect, holy, forever by the perfect blood of Christ. So that the place, the holy place, the God place, the place where heaven and earth meets, where God could meet his people in the Old Testament, that place is now in our heart. There's no separation. Praise the Lord. So being brought near. Verse 14, another conjunction word, for or because. So we have and, we have but, we have therefore, now we have for or because. Because he himself is our peace, who has made both one. He is our peace, made both. Who's both? The Jew and the Gentile. He has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his place, in his flesh, the enmity. There is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. The last few Sundays, I've encouraged us, don't be afraid of reading the Old Testament. You need to understand it. We're not under it. We're not trying to follow it to be righteous, but we need to understand it. So that what Christ has fulfilled, we understand what he has fulfilled. Amen. Those ordinances and commandments in the Old Testament separates Jew and Gentile. Because all those commandments are only unique to, to Israel. Because Jehovah is unique. And so his people are unique because he is unique. Amen. But he tells them, don't mess up and don't follow the rest. They're not the same as me. I will assure you of these good things. You follow them, you're going to get seriously all the bad things. And I, you know why? I'll share a secret with you, says the Lord. Because I've come to judge them. Their iniquity is full. Don't be foolish to follow them because then you follow their iniquity. You end up in the same judgment. But you stick to my rules. Some of it seems, looks similar, but some of it is seriously different. Choose life. Choose life. Choose blessing. Choose life. I will lead you to a good place because I swore to your fathers, Abraham, to his son, Isaac, to his son, Jacob, that I will give a good place. Wow. Of course, it was a long, disappointing story. But did God change? He didn't. He didn't change. 
His plans remain the same. That's why he's trustworthy. He's faithful. He does not change. The law was perfect, but it was not good enough, even though it's perfect. Why? Because of our flesh. It could never make us righteous. It can only condemn us and say, you trespass and sin. That's all it can do. Cannot make you holy. So Jesus came to pay the price and now he has made us holy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote to remind the church in Ephesus, this is the reality, this is the history, this is what's happened. You must understand this so that you can go forward. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. And the other thing is this, by the way, I'm in prison. Don't you think and judge that because I'm in prison, God has forgotten me. You have to understand in all this whole context of stuff. I'm getting ahead of myself. In chapter 3, he wants them to understand the revelation of God's love for them. Of how there is a mystery which in the ages past was never revealed. And this mystery is that the Gentiles have an inheritance in God. This was never, ever known before. And he says, through the grace of God, I'm an, an apostle and I'm bringing this good news to you. God is working all of these fantastic things. And even though I'm in prison, don't let this thing, don't let this thing that I'm in prison put you off. I'm able to do all of these things because of the power that works through me. The power that he introduced in chapter 1. I'm ahead of myself. Uh, where are we now? Okay. Verse 6 of Ephesians 3. I'm jumping ahead, right? That the, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel in which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Just staying here for a few moments. The power that he introduced in chapter 1, that he prayed for the church to have a spiritual understanding and revelation, the power that God used to raise Jesus up and put him up in the highest place above all principalities, powers, and dominions. That power he introduced as working towards us. But it's not just painting a picture that one day we'll be up there. He's saying that power that I introduced has worked in me since day one. I was a Jew. I am still a Jew, but the difference is I'm now a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm now bringing also to you this mystery to you that you Gentiles have the same access to the God that I serve. I, need, I will introduce you and tell you how that has happened. And all the things that I've done and you witness and you see is because of the power of God that works through me. I've survived shipwrecks, I've been beaten, I've been stoned. I survived all those things because of God's favor upon me. I want to also want you to understand God's love. So that when I'm gone, and the Roman emperor executed him, when I'm gone, the truth that I deposit with you will never, will never be gone. You continue in the same way. Allowing grace and the power of God to work through you. Amen. And the world will surely be transformed. Because you and I are his workmanship for good works. Amen. Romans persecute us, throw us to the lions and so on and so forth. That's bad. God will take care of it. Meanwhile, we know who God is and we commit and submit ourselves to him. Now, the church is alive, remains alive, even though it's persecuted in many countries. Israel is now a nation. It disappeared for 2,000 years. 
came back in 1948. It's a miracle. Not just a miracle, it activates many Bible prophecies because those Bible prophecies cannot be fulfilled without the state of Israel. But that can now be fulfilled because there is a state of Israel. The Roman Empire is no more. Babylon is no more. Assyria is no more and so on and so forth because it's prophecy. Verse 14, the chapter 2. He himself is our peace. He has made us one. He has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh, flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself what? One new man from the two, thus making peace. Between Jew and Gentile, the separation of gods or idols and Yahweh. That contention, that argument, no more. Christ has satisfied that. He is our peace. It's no longer about comparing gods and temples. It's about knowing the Creator Himself and what He has done. And the evidence that He is God. He died, He buried, and He rose again. And all the good works he did from day one, all the scriptures that he fulfilled in the Old Testament, the list goes on. He is satisfied past all the tests. This is now the God that we need to know. And he won, he has made peace. Verse 16, he made peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and those who are near. For through him, we now have access by one spirit to the Father. So it's one family in God's name. No longer umpteen religions and umpteen gods, but one. Amen. And I think the church is about the only place whereby you can sit people of all shapes and colors and cultures and so on and languages. Amen. Like the two reps from the ship, MB Dulos Hope, who are here in the lineup team. You met Jabulani, South African, muscular chap. He's, a, he's an athlete with a sports diploma and everything else. And uh, his life's journey, eventually he volunteered to join the ship. And you couldn't have a bigger contrast. So Jabulani being African, he's black. His teammate, Tim, is a German chap. He's blonde. And the two of them in a team. Hallelujah. Could be further in separation, right? And we pray for our nation. A nation of many tribes and tongues, especially in Sarawak and Sabah, that we can be found one because Christ is our peace. Holy Spirit, help us, help our nation. In your mercy, give us revelation to all those who matter that your glory can be seen. We want to bless the MOU, the BM has with uh, some churches in Kalimantan, they have a project called One Borneo. That the gospel progresses and bring more and more people into the body of Christ. So that we don't see Sarawak, Brunei, Sabah, and Kalimantan. And Kalimantan is so big, you Kalimantan, Barat, Timor, Tengah, Selatan. You know, every time I look at the map before I went to Indonesia, wow, Sarawak looks big, man. Until I went over the other side of the border, I see their map. But Kalimantan, lagi big. Sarawak becomes very small. We think our oh, Rejang, what a mighty Rejang River, how long it is. When we see the Kapuas, eh, the Rejang looks very small. <laughs> but one Borneo in Christ. Last bit of, past, last bit of chapter 2. Now, therefore, so we have had and therefore, but <laughs> because now, therefore, as a wrap up, as a conclusion, 
to this chapter. He hasn't finished yet. That's in chapter 3, right? But for now, we'll just stick to the bottom of chapter 2. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and for foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, therefore, be in grace. Do not think of yourself just as a family, individual, or a member of the church, and this is optional, and that is not, whatever it is. You are no longer foreigners. You are in Christ. You are part of His program. Allow yourself to fit in. Amen. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is important. Not, not a foundation of you know, some guru somewhere. The apostles and the prophets. The apostles are the sent out ones. They are inspired by scripture, Old Testament scripture. They see Jesus fulfilling them and they've been inspired by the Holy Spirit and have been called and given and sent out in, in, a ministry, in a ministry. And the prophets, the prophets who prophesied about Christ and the prophets who prophesied about the church. All of it in harmony, giving glory to our Lord Jesus Christ, who has come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill every single part. Amen. That he and he alone is the Messiah. The foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Everything is about him. Not in the distance. It's about him for our existence. He is the chief cornerstone. Without him, there's no spiritual building. Without him, the physical building also will just look like a physical building. There's no presence. He is the chief cornerstone. That means without him, all the walls cannot stand. All the, prof all the things that we read about cannot happen. But with him, it is there. Then he says, 21, In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You and I, Regardless of our past, yes, all of us were in trespasses and sin before. But the whole purpose of this letter is, don't just think about that. Think about where you are now. And where you are now, don't get cocky. You must understand where you were before. So that together we go forward with what plan He has for us. Amen. The good works because we are His workmanship. And the good works needs expansion and clarification for you. It's more than just touring it for the beggar downstairs. It's more than giving somebody a motorcycle. It's more than sending somebody a love gift. I remember Bill Winston saying, you send somebody a love gift to help the homeless. Why don't you just give him a home? Oh, that's challenging, right? Why don't you just give him a home instead of $5? Love give to the homeless. Is God big enough for that? Can he do it? If he puts a thought in your heart, it might sound outrageous, but will you be willing to bring it to him in prayer? That he could bring it to pass? He just tell me, bless me and grace. And I, I thought, well, okay. Uh, not too difficult to do, right? If I'm preaching here, I give you the benediction, I already bless all. But then he had other things in mind. Amen. And so we're on, the, on, on that journey still. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God. In the spirit. Are you in? Are you a part of this holy temple in the Lord? A dwelling place of God in the spirit? Don't disqualify yourself. He has qualified you. In our humility, we acknowledge where we were before. But in our same humility, we acknowledge to God we are present. 
And so we are for serving him. Amen. Because he created us after his image, gave us a task, provided all the resources and all the potentials. And all he wants us to do is tend the garden, make it fruitful, make it beautiful. You know why? He comes to the garden too, because he enjoys his walk in the garden. And he wants us to be present with him. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for such a wonderful plan. <laughs> such a wonderful plan that is not just mysterious, but you have made it known to us through your letter. Bless BM Grace to comprehend your scope. Fill us with your spirit. Send us the resources to make it happen. A holy temple for you. A dwelling place in the spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.